Hi students, welcome to HSC Earth and Environmental Science and Module 6 on Hazards. This is video number 10. We're going to be looking at a case study specifically focusing on Mount Pinatubo. Your learning intention for this particular piece of work is to investigate in a case study one eruption that has had a significant effect on the biosphere and atmosphere and assess that impact, including but not limited to Mount Pinatubo. So therefore, this one is focusing on Mount Pinatubo and the sort of stuff that you might put into your case study, but it also encourages you to have a look at something else as well. So we want to be able to prepare a case study um, similar to some of the things that I'll hopefully share with you in this video, um, looking at the Mount Pinatubo volcanic eruption, to discuss a specific impact of this, obviously this particular one we're looking at, on the atmosphere and the biosphere, and I guess more broadly the climate, and then to assess that specific impact. So that's part of the process of developing a case study is you need to be very clear about what you're looking at and what example you're going to use uh, when answering a question around these sorts of concepts. So when we think about um, volcanic eruptions, or at least in recent times that have had a significant impact on the climate and therefore on the atmosphere and on the biosphere, there's three that probably um, come to mind. The first is the 1815 um, eruption of Tambora. 1883 in Krakatoa, uh, and then 1991 is the Mount Pinatubo eruption. Now, this is not to suggest that these are the most violent eruptions, um, but what they have had and what we need to do uh, when we're looking at our case study is we have to link these eruptions to um, impacts on the biosphere and the atmosphere. And so therefore, these three are the, probably the best ones to pick if you want to look for information about that sort of direct impact uh, on the on global climate. So in other places I've talked about case studies, uh, you can even use the acronym a case to sort of help you uh, identify the key elements of a case study. First of all, what is a case study? So a case study is a particular type of research and so that's one of the things that we want to kind of look at straight away. So therefore if you're just taking um, information from this video. I'm hoping, hoping that um, you'll supplement that with other information, if for no other reason than to at least check that what I'm giving you is correct information. And that's very good research practice. Never get all of your information from a single site or single source, even if that source is someone who is maybe standing on top or above the volcano as it was erupting which of course they probably wouldn't be. Uh, the second aspect of a case study is that it is a detailed study. It looks at us, so it's detailed, it looks at a specific subject, and ideally we're trying to tell a story. We've got a purpose in what it is that we're trying to uh, build from our case study. So this is very much about the purpose. And you remember from the beginning that this is about uh, impacts of volcanic eruptions on the biosphere and the atmosphere. And this is kind of the end of our little mini series, if you like, on volcanoes, volcanic eruptions and hazards and disasters, because it's really pulling together all of those key ideas that we've looked at previously into one single um, research uh, work that uh, goes through not just the eruptions, but also some of the impacts that they had for a specific uh, volcanic eruption at a specific moment in time. So one other way to think about case studies is, is as the four A's. The four A's, if you're after an A in your case study, is you need to action your task. So you need to figure out what you actually need to do. You need to arrange your research. As I said, you're not going to just pick one source here. If you do, you're going to have a poor case study. Uh, you need to supplement uh, one source with a number of other sources. You need to think about the types of sources you're using and to make sure that the, there's consistency between the different sources in terms of the information that they're providing you with. You need to assimilate your ideas. And assimilation is basically what happens when I eat food and it becomes part of the chemistry of my body. So it means that I'm actually taking that on. I'm incorporating it into what's already there. So in order to assimilate your ideas, you need to actually think through what you've read so you can put something down that tells this coherent story. So, okay, there was an eruption. Where did it occur? Um, when did it occur? What was the impact of it? How big was it? Was it effusive? Was it explosive? How did it impact the atmosphere? How did it impact the biosphere? If I can tell you all of those things off the top of my head, then I have started to assimilate those ideas. I've started to make them mine. And of course, if you can assimilate your ideas, 
then you are in a very, very um, much stronger position, not just to write a good quality report, but to also to remember some of those key aspects of that if you get asked a question about this in your HSC at the end of the year. And of course, the last one is to acknowledge your sources. And we, if we're doing any sort of research, it's, it's critically important that we make sure that we track all our sources along the way. Now, you may read more widely than the actual sources you quote in your case study, but nevertheless, it's important to make sure that you're acknowledging those sources. Now, now two of these are kind of um, givens. So the arranging of the research, I'm not going to talk through because I'm hoping by now you already have some places that you would go. And I'm sure we'll all hit Google straight up. Hopefully we'll hit Google Scholar straight up because that's actually a better source for research than just any old websites. Um, but and also we'll start uh, I guess when we're setting out our reports, maybe we're typing these up into Word, um, that we're also starting to set a bibliography or a, or a reference list. So this is keeping track of all of the sources that we use, websites, pages from textbook, journal articles, uh, all sorts of different maybe video materials that you've watched. And that you can acknowledge each of these as potential sources of information that you've used. Uh, in the production of your case study. Let's do it. Let's look at Mount Pinatubo. So what's the action? So the action that we need is what type of eruption? So that's the first thing. Um, and I guess the type of eruption is pretty obvious uh, because if it was a quiet, soft, effusive eruption, then it probably wouldn't have had a big impact uh, on the atmosphere and the biosphere. And we've picked these ones specifically because they do. And so therefore you can probably guess that this one's gonna be an explosive eruption. Um, hazard or disaster. So remember that we've um, got our definition now for where a hazard becomes a disaster. What are the critical measures? Um, do we have an estimation of the number of deaths? Is that the only thing we should look at in terms of whether it's a hazard or whether it's a disaster? The local impact. So what was happening um, locally around Mount Pinatubo or on Mount Pinatubo and climactically. Remember climate effects are global or at least they're more widespread than the local and they're also a, a different time frame so for a climatic effect we don't just want you know a few thunderstorms and then the rain kind of came and then it went and everything was fine again we want some sort of change that may have uh, been observable and measurable over some period of time that maybe told us that there was some sort of uh, impact happening in the in the atmosphere that was actually affecting the climate. So as I said, I'm skipping the um, one of these steps and I'm going straight to assimilate because assimilates when you write your report. So so the assimilation bit is I've done all my research, I've gathered um, some bits of information from different places, and now I'm going to put down some ideas. Now, when you're writing a, an an exam, an HSC exam response, you can use dot points. Um, but I would encourage you to try and write as, um, as formally as you possibly can, uh, remembering that if you're going to try and structure something, particularly a longer response question, and usually we'd, we'd try, we're looking at maybe seven to nine uh, marks for one or two of the questions in your paper. So there will be some that will be a little bit open for you to write lots in, of information in. And whilst you might have a plan that's set out in dot points, you would want to write your final response um, as more of a readable paragraph kind of response. But I'm not going to read you a response. I'm just going to give you some of the key points that you might um, want to include if you were looking at putting a case study together around Mount Pinatubo. So when did it happen? Well, when it started is an interesting um, thing to go and research because there were a couple of little signs. There were a few things that happened that we think may have uh, triggered this particular eruption. And some of those happened um, several months ahead of the actual um, significant eruptions. But there were certainly some things building. And between the 7th and the 12th of June in 1991, magma which was rising through the mountain, first reached the surface of Mount Pinatubo. Now it had lost most of its volatiles, so some of the volatiles had already escaped. Now this is an interesting thing for us to think about because volatiles are those uh, often carbon dioxide, gas, um, hydrogen as water vapor um, that build up and that can create those great explosions. Um, so the fact that some of the volatiles had already been lost on the way, kind of already been bubbling out or, or emerging as steam, um, 
is an interesting one because maybe it's it's meant that we didn't have quite as much uh, of an explosion as we expected to. And surprisingly, this first part of the eruption was effusive. It wasn't explosive. So our first guess when we were thinking, well, if we're going to look at something like this, we're looking at an explosive eruption. Well, it wasn't initially. We formed a little lava dome. And of course, we get that because it's low in volatilities. We get this slow um, oozing of the magma and we form this nice little lava dome. And if that's where it had stopped, we probably wouldn't be talking about it. But it wasn't. On June the 12th, 1991, millions of cubic metres of gas-charged magma reached the surface. And they did that very quickly in behind this effusive magma lava dome and went kaboom. The surface um, exploded on the 15th. So you had that couple of days build up as the um, lava in, under, as a magma really, uh, underneath that sort of initial effusive eruption continued to build and then a couple of days later, we went from a couple of cubic metres of material to more than five cubic kilometres of material. That's massive. So if you think of the scale of how much uh, material is being thrown into the atmosphere, this, this is explosive. This is cataclysmic. Okay, this is a monster of an eruption. And the ash cloud from this particular eruption rose an estimated 35 kilometers into the atmosphere. Now again, here's where we have atmospheric effects. We have potential climate change effects uh, at an absolute minimum, some sort of um, interactions happening in both the troposphere and the stratosphere, and maybe some, some initial cooling, some um, longer term warming. Well, let's have a look and see if we can kind of see if we can figure out what's going on with this eruption. At the low altitudes, the ash was blown in all directions because there was that was purely coincidental and not linked to the volcanic eruption at all. A typhoon that hit this area about the same time, and the intense winds associated with a, a typhoon only stirred all this ash up even further and just blew it all in, in all different directions. But at higher altitudes, so when we go higher up through our, our atmosphere, then you get a little more stability, not quite so much circling and, and, th and throwing of stuff everywhere. You get a fairly consistent movement of the ash and this ash movement was southwest. A blanket of volcanic ash and larger pumice blanketed the countryside. So all of this stuff, obviously it's particulate matter. And the thing with particulates is they will fall, sometimes very slowly, under the influence of gravity. Think um, when, when we're talking about some of these ash clouds, kind of um, maybe helpful in your mind to think about what it looks like if you get some mud, very, very fine mud in some water and you kind of stir it all up. And you can see that the mud's there. You can see that those tiny little particles are there present in the water. And if we give them long enough, they will settle, but they don't settle straight away. They kind of cloudy that water up for some, some period of time. And that's basically the problem that we have here. This, this mountain of ash that's being spewed into the atmosphere is basically um, making dirty air for some period of time before it's going to all settle back down. Fine ash reached the Indian Ocean and satellites tracked the ash cloud several times around the globe. This is one of these cataclysmic eruptions that can have a devastating effect on the, um, on the planet because of the way that these ash clouds can be distributed around the around the globe. Accompanying all of this ash being thrown to the air was py um, pyroclastic flows that then started to move down the mountain and um, the valleys which were once quite deep were then filled with these volcanic deposits up to about 200 meters in thickness. So that's two football fields high of this um, pyroclastic hot rock um, uh, lava flowing down into um, these 
these valleys. Under this enormous pressure, the summit collapsed so that the, the crater's fallen in, the top part of the volcano's fallen in, and it's formed a caldera two and a half kilometres across. Thick valley filling pyroclastic flow deposits insulated themselves and they kept their heat. Five years after this event, there were still temperatures as high as 500 degrees Celsius being recorded from the, um, the, the lava flows that were cooling, but cooling very, very slowly. On the positive side, early warning systems resulted in the saving of at least 5,000 lives and $250 million in property. So right there, we're thinking, well, maybe disaster's been avoided. We only have a particularly bad hazard. But we also had 20 million tons of sulfur dioxide injected into the stratosphere. We had planes that weren't aware flying through there and there was millions, I think, uh, in the $100, $150 million worth of damage done to planes, jets that had flown, uh, not realizing what they were going into. And obviously, once you're in something like this, um, the, the chances of getting easily back out are not great. The dispersal of um, sulfur dioxide gas caused temporary global temperature cooling. So remember, one of the things that happens when we get these um, aerosols basically going into the um, upper parts of the atmosphere is that we get some global cooling happening first. Not a lot. Um, in the, in the subsequent couple of years after the eruption of Mount Pinatubo, we saw a little bit of a half a degree average. Remember, average drops aren't that amount everywhere. There's higher and lower values, but they averaged out. Whilst we've talked about a lot of lives were saved through early warning systems, many of the indigenous people were displaced. A lot of them lived on the slopes of the, the volcano and obviously had to get out of the way and um, and that has been a very long time waiting for them to be able to return to their homelands. A greater number, 200,000 people evacuated from the lowlands surrounding Pinatubo before and during the eruptions have gone back home, but the, there's still potential problems with Lahars. Remember, Lahars are basically going to be a problem during the rainy time where it's going to pick up all of that loose ash um, create mudslides and just flow that over these um, low-lying towns and villages. Rice paddies and cane fields that have not been buried by lahars have recovered, but some of those that, that did get hit by lahars will be out of use for years to come. So I think this is where we, where we have our hazard duck, ducking back into the disaster zone because it's not just about human life, which we've done very well to, to preserve, but it's also about the speed of recovery. And obviously, to be able to recover after an event like this, it can be very, very difficult. So we've got some impacts on the atmosphere, and we've got some impacts on the biosphere. It's worth having a little bit of a look, and, and this picture gives you a bit of a sense of just how devastating lahars can be. So even after the volcanic eruption is over, two months after Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines exploded, you had um, lahars creating even more damage or, or delayed damage, if you like, just by the fact that rains came and they picked up all of this um, ash that had settled on the ground and basically created this mud flow that then came down. And you can see the difference between um, the two um, housetops and exactly how deep you must have to bury something, how much material you must have flowing in an area to bury a house that deep that you can only just see the, the roof. So one to have a look at in a little bit more detail and maybe um, another one of those examples to sort of supplement your understanding of Mount Pinatubo um, just as a, as a case study for you. Case studies do require a little bit of work, a little bit of practice and a bit of research to, uh, to just organise your ideas and organise your thoughts. But if you've got some key points that you want to raise, remembering that we're trying to link volcanic eruptions to changes in the atmosphere and the biosphere and Mount Pinatubo, whilst um, a, a sad example is a good example of one of these eruptions. Thanks for watching.